Now, the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ says, come as you are. But it doesn't say stay as you are. That series, by the way, that excerpt came from a series that Armin is running. And uh, he uh, talked about that. And you've got the flyer advertising. It's coming up in a month or two. Um, and it's got some great DVDs as part of that course. But um, Jesus said, don't uh, paraphrase, it's, it's come as you are, but it's not stay as you are. That we know we're not saved by our good works, but we are saved to do good works, to be liberated from deaf, dumb and blind idols that spring from our imagination and worship the living and true God as we wait for Jesus to return. And so what has, um, how does God expect us to grow as we battle with the idols that we're sort of swimming in? Um, What are what the Christians in the past have called the means of grace? And there are a number of them. There's the Bible. There's prayer. That's why in our church we've been doing heavily pushing undivided attention. There's the ministry of the spirit that works from within. Christianity is the only religion that works from within out, changing the heart, giving you desires you never had. And the fourth one is fellowship, and that's the focus of our time together this conference, that God expects us to grow through fellowship. Even God thinks we're better together. Uh, he came up with the idea. Uh, what, what proves it for me is when you discover there are not one, not 20, not 40, 55 verses that speak of one another ministry. That the ministry of the word isn't just the Sunday preaching. Sunday preaching is not enough, critical as it is. Growth groups are crucial, but not enough. You can't have, you can't grow in maturity until you're part of one another ministry. It's still, the problem with Sunday preaching and, and group ministry is that it's not personal enough. It's not specifically applied. It's still out there. Um, Harvard Business Review did a study and it showed 95% of people can't apply a principle. And it's probably a reminder to us that God built us in a way that needed us to need each other in our journey. And I think of that, I think of that statistic. It's really haunted me as a preacher as well as, a, as just a person. 95% of people can't apply a principle. And I think that's me. I need someone to walk with me. I, I, I need someone who will keep me on track, who will share my journey, who will hold me accountable, who will fill in the missing gaps, who will tell me what it looks like. Um, Otherwise, I keep remaining in cycles of sin and keep justifying it. I keep this never-ending treadmill of going nowhere. Left to myself, I drift. I don't know about you, but I just drift. I wander. There is a ministry that is for every one of us. Whether you're gifted in teaching or not, it is called the ministry of pairing up, the ministry of one another, one-on-one, that makes the truths of God by the Spirit of God applied into the heart of God's man, personally. Let me say it again. 55 verses plus that speak of our call to minister to one another. Here's Here's a summary of what they are. We're called to love one another fervently or with brotherly affection, where to bear with one another, admonish and teach one another, speak the truth to each other, spur one another on to love and good deeds, to not complain about one another, to be hospitable with one another, to serve one another, to be kind to one another, to confess your sins with one another, to be subject to one another, to consider others more important than yourself, to live in peace with one another, to forgive one another, to be devoted to one another, to greet each other with a holy kiss. Well, I'm pretty sure most of us, except maybe Sarkis, if you know Sarkis from our church, keeps the last command. The rest of us obey, disobey that. Give each other a holy kiss. You know, the key idea I'm really thumping here is that if you want to grow, if you want to excel, if you want to deal with the idols in your life, you want to make progress, um, you want to be devoted to the things God wants you to be devoted to, then we need to have men spending time with men, one-on-one, open Bibles, open hearts. Say that again. Men spending time with men, one-on-one, open Bibles, open hearts. That's it. Now, we're going to flesh it out, but that's it. So um, what do you do when you're together, one-on-one? Well, let's let's go back to some of the one-another verses to guide us. 
in uh, James 5.6. It's in the context of sickness and healing, but nevertheless, it's, it stands. It's repeated elsewhere. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Pray for each other. A brother uh, hears your story, your struggle, uh, brings you before the throne of grace. Did that with Zach. We prayed about an issue. We shared the same issue. We brought each other before the throne. We stood between each other and the throne of grace and interceded for each other. We're fulfilling this command as you were when you were praying. There's nothing more humbling, nothing more beautiful than when a man asks for prayer. Can you pray for me? Uh, I think of, you know, in Colossians 4 verse 4, the Apostle Paul is asking the Colossians, he says this about his evangelism, pray that I may proclaim it, that is the gospel, clearly as I should. I find that really weird. Here is Paul, the great apostle of the Gentiles, awesome teacher, fantastic effective evangelist. And what is he doing? He's asking these young Christians, pray for me that I may preach it clearly as I should. Isn't that humbling? He's an apostle. Man, he's got the runs on the board. When was the last time those words came from your mouth? Please pray for me. Uh, it's our, it hits at our pride, doesn't it? Especially in the areas that you're good at. I need help. Oh, it speaks to my fears, that. You know, we've got to understand the, the, you know, when we gather together one-on-one, -on -one, the importance of prayer because it is our spiritual armour. We engage not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. I don't care if you're talking about your bad boss, your critical wife, your wayward children. Understand, peel behind the story and the evil one and the smell of sulphur of, of, of hell has got fumes all over that. Behind all those issues is a demonic activity tempting and we are engaged in a battle against principalities and powers. We live in times that are of extreme pressure and stress. Men have, you've got to understand, you live in a unique time. Never have so many men been exposed to so much porn, so accessible, so addictive in so many creative forms. It, so bad is it, even the pagans want to give up on it. That's right. I'm hearing non-Christian groups set up to get over the addiction to, to porn. You know it's bad when people without the spirit want to, are already seeing the ha damaging effects. And our society is more complex. It is more, I think it's right to say that. Um, you only have to see someone who moves to a third world country and then comes in. The complexity of our world, it's hard to navigate. I need someone to pray for me in that as I make decisions. And there are going to be times when you will be under severe testing. Oh, and to have a brother in arms pray for you is a beautiful thing. So put up your hand. So we pray for one another. We critically encourage one another. 1 Thessalonians 5.10, or is it Hebrews 3? I don't know if you've got the... Okay, good. Here, this is what it says. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. Or Hebrews 3. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you have an, a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But, in, now you see, don't, don't have an unbelieving heart. What is he, he doesn't say, you know, have a quiet time, even though that's true, but encourage one another daily, as long as you call it today, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. So how does God expect us to make it to the end well? How do you stop yourself from your heart getting hardened? How do you prevent yourself from being deceived by the lies of the world? This is telling us by the one another ministry of encouragement. Gathering with another and having them speak words of life. Notice that it's not pop psychology that you're, being, you're, you're, you're promoting. It's actually words of God. The word encouragement actually means to come alongside and speak. And to come alongside a brother and speak words of life is a beautiful thing. To speak words that overturn what my father said. I'm not saying my father, but what your mother, father might have said, that I'm useless, but in God's hands I'm useful. To speak words of life 
that overturns what your teacher or boss might say about you, that you won't amount to anything, when in Christ Jesus you have amounted to everything. Encourage one another. Pray for one another. Confess your sins to one another. James 5.16 Therefore confess your sins to each other. There should be no hiding, no pretending. Um, this passage doesn't say confess your sins to your priest, your pastor, your elder, your, your growth group leader. It actually um, uh, it says confess your sins to another. Um, what sins? Any sin. Resentment, grudge. The fact that I'm being drawn towards the secretary at the office, whatever it is, confess it. Envy, anger, jealousy. Now God has authorised us to go directly to him and to confess our sins. We do not go to others for absolution and forgiveness. Why then do we go to others to confess our sins to one another? Why would you do that? Well, probably for two reasons. One, you might have sinned against them and therefore you need to confess. <laughs> I'm sorry I shouldn't have done that. But two, and I don't think that's the case here, I think the case here is in, in confessing your sins to another, that other person gets to share back to you the gospel of grace and apply it. That that image bearer who's renewed in Christ gets to speak words to that specific person sin that you're convicted of and say to you, brother, you are forgiven. I need to have people tell me that. Not only that I, that I am loved and how I'm loved, that I'm forgiven and why I'm forgiven in spite of what I've done again and again and again. Because I want to just condemn myself. I need another outside of me to speak a word of life. That I'm chosen by God and I need to know why I'm chosen by God when I seem to behave so atrociously. In short, I and you need to be told that God hasn't given up on us when we've given up on ourselves. Because we wouldn't put up with the kind of crap we, we give God. But he is a merciful God. That when I'm at my worst, that I need you to tell me God still loves me no less. Just like when I'm, when I'm obedient, he loves me no more. Here is a love that I can't earn. Here is a love that I can't lose. Here is a love that I need to be reminded of. That's why we confess our sins to one another, so we can preach the gospel to each other. And there are many things, things to say, but it's not when we gather together one-on-one, -on -one, it's not just about praying, confessing, encouraging. It is about urging, stimulating, spurring one another on to love and good deeds. Look at Hebrews 10:24. And let us consider how we might spur one another on towards love and good deeds and not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Isn't that beautiful? See, the Christian life is not about just surviving. It's about thriving. It's about growing to be more and more like Jesus and less and less like the world. It's about wanting to do more and more good works and less and less acts of rebellion. And the best place to do that, to learn that, to grow in that, is the one-on-one -on -one relationship. It is the absolute pinnacle, I think, where you apply God's words specifically to issues as they present. The one-on-one -on -one relationship becomes the best place to talk about those most delicate of areas that you can't share with very many people. The one-on-one -on -one relationship becomes the best way to learn in a very focused way. Why is it that so many Asians are doing well in the HSC? Because they got tutors. They're smart. Their kids are all tutored. That's why they're all in the top 40 HSC success. Tutoring is the key. That's what it is. It's tutoring. Getting one-on-one -on -one learning and applied. And that's the best way to learn, friends. That's the best way to thrive. Now, what I want to do, friends, in the next session is um, we're going to look at three aspects, but not in a teaching way. Uh, we're going to look at professional counselling. You think, why would you talk about that? Because I want to partly distinguish it from the other two things I want to talk about and not confuse them. And partly, uh, let me define professional counselling. It's a one-on-one -on -one relationship with open hearts and a Christian framework of grace where you, will, where you work on specific life concerns, even the most personal, and the ultimate goal is to be more like the Lord Jesus. That's with a skilled, a highly trained person. You tend to pay for that ministry because it requires a professional person to, with the skills in it. I'm a real fan of it. You know me, half of MBM have been, the other half need to go. Um, 
Sorry if you're not in New Life. I'm pretty sure it's the same for New Life. I'm definitely, I'm sure it is. Half have gone, the other half need to go. Um, it plays an important part in one another ministry. It's for a period of time in your life. It's not the thing you do all the time, but it is an important place. I don't know how many guys have grown in that. And I can't teach you that. I can, I can explain it. I can give you a definition. But really, I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm going to be there after morning tea. David Ratz is going to counsel me for 10 minutes. You'll have a great time at my expense. Secondly... Foundational is discipling. Here's the definition of discipling. So these are different things. Discipling is not counselling. Discipling is one-on-one -on -one relationship with open hearts and open Bibles where you work on the foundations of the Christian life. Prayer, Bible reading, witnessing, assurance. The ultimate goal is to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Too many Christians have not had the foundation laid for them and they kind of always on the back foot ever since. Um, that is something I encourage for everyone to, to go through. Mark Borley is going to walk us through that journey. And then thirdly uh, is mentoring. And uh, after I wipe the tears off my face and get myself together, I'll come back uh, uh, after Mark comes. And mentoring is, again, different from discipling and it's certainly different from counselling. It's a one-on-one -on -one relationship with... Uh, with I think there's an extra and there. With open hearts and open Bibles where you work on two or three personal goals. These goals are chosen by you and written down and your mentor will encourage you and hold you to them each month. The ultimate goal is to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Counselling, discipling, mentoring. That's what we're going to do when we come back from morning tea, but we're not going to go to morning tea now. We're going to go to the third of the activities together. And on page 11, because you've got to think now, now, some of you have done this when you did, if you did the leadership course, um, but I'm going to do it again because it's helpful. There's a character inventory on page 11. And I, we want you to, this is a private thing now. This is confidential. Um, there's however many questions there are. Um, what is it, about 30? And basically, they're aspects of your character. They're aspects of your character where you pick up where are you weak or strong in? And just mark them. If you're lousy at thankfulness, you may want to put a zero. If you're great at thankfulness, living a thankful life, you may want to put six or whatever the dimensions are. So that'll take you about 10 minutes and then you'll go back and pick the three areas you really need to work on and write them down. Then I want you to actually share them. Um, I'll just follow my notes here because the, my problem is... Then in pairs, choose one of those three areas that you want to, perhaps the one you feel safest to share, and just share it with the person next to you and maybe pray for each other in that area. Okay? So we wanna, I want you to now think, before we talk about mentoring, counselling, discipling, I want you to think, well, what area do I need to grow in? That inventory is going to help you, let me tell you. So in the next 10 minutes, quietly, okay, don't, this is not the time to have conversation. Firstly, do it, and then when you're able to, with the person next to you, share one of those three things and then pray.